Mike Sawajek is with Continental Structural Plastics, and I wanted to talk to him today because you're working on battery packs. And Mike, there's so much interest in that. There's still a lot of development work going on with uh, electric cars, but what is CSP doing with battery packs? Well, we had a, we have a, a long history with you know the, the current battery market. We started with the original Volt. We did the, the box that covered that battery pack. And we've seen that market um, really expand and really change over the last few years. And now it's really a big emerging market for us. And the technology changes very quickly. And we have a lot of work to do, but we, we've come a very long way just from that original Volt box. So even though the Volt or the Bolt didn't sell in huge quantities, you must have learned a lot being part of that program. Yeah, I mean, we did the Volt, the, the first two Volt generations, and we did the Chevy Spark. So we had some experience, but now globally, we're seeing the battery um, enclosure market expand exponentially. So we have we have a lot of business in China currently with our Chinese um, subsidiary um, in CSP Victal. And then we're really attacking the European market as well. But we're also starting to see, uh, you know, OEMs here in the U.S. and North America start to adapt that technology. So we've got we've got all different grades and all different levels, but we're seeing a lot more um, movement around that market. Well, if you're on the Gen 1 Volt and you're on programs today, what are the, the kind of changes that are going into battery packs? Well, the original for, for us, we, you know, we're, we're the enclosure provider. So, you know, we, we deliver an enclosure to our customer or another a battery supplier that would um, put together that, that pack for the OEM. And the original generations were mainly just structural battery enclosures. So uh, just, just a box, if you will. But now the boxes have to be, have to meet much more stringent requirements as, as lithium ion batteries have, have started to enter the market and, and proliferate, there's a lot of different requirements that become important. You know, I watched your, uh, your overnight with Bob Gallion and he talked about, you know, his five golden rules and one of them is safety. And safety is really the most difficult uh, to achieve. So we started out, there used to be a, a test or there still is a test called a, a bonfire test that came out of the railway industry that China had adapted. And we were working on that, and then all of a sudden it became thermal runaway. And you, you know, you've you even alluded to in that interview. You talked about uh, some of these lithium fires you see on the internet. Um, our, our box has to mitigate those, and so there's a lot of work being done, both in the design, but also the chemistry. So that's where my group comes in. There's also different philosophies between the automakers as to whether just bolting the battery pack mm -hmm. into the the chassis of the car, the structure of the car, or making it a structural member. Are, are you guys working on both approaches or what? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we, we're we we're full service and we work with all the OEMs. So it depends on the, the geometry and the architecture that they desire. But you're right. I, I see a lot of the market moving towards what you hear people refer to as a skateboard approach. So you have a full a full structure of the under under vehicle that uh, so the, the box itself has to take a lot of that that architecture and, and that engineering, that structure to hold up. The, you know, the, the vehicle itself, but also enclose the battery and also provide the, the safety requirements. Automakers are going with different types of batteries. Tesla, of course, going with the cylindrical types. Uh, General Motors going mm -hmm. with the, the pouch type. Many others going with the, the prismatic, which looks like a little box. Mm -hmm. Does it make any difference to you guys when you're designing a battery pack? For us, we, we work with the vehicle architecture. So uh, the OEM will come to us and say, you know, here's the design, here's the design shape and space that you have. Whatever you, whatever enclosure you give us has to meet, you know, these dimensional requirements. You can't go outside of that. It also has to meet these structural and crash requirements and so on and so forth. Um, we're not uh, designing current systems with any internal architecture. Really, it's it's just an enclosure right now. You know, and most of the our, our current business and previous business have been just the covers, but now we're starting to look at doing entire enclosure systems. We have the, the underneath, the underside tray as well as the cover. But um, next gen, we want to look at working with some of these battery suppliers that maybe can we incorporate because, you know, thermal, the composites that we use uh, allow us to do a lot of different design features. So we can maybe put in the architecture for putting in the different battery uh, cell structures and shapes. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I, I haven't seen a whole lot of battery packs, but the ones I have seen are mm -hmm. aluminum. And clearly, as you said, you know, you're using composites on this. Uh, 
And for the very reason you just cited, I, I would imagine you could incorporate things that would, you know, allow for attachment points inside the pack that wouldn't be as easy to do with an aluminum one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, we think that's, you know, that's where our value proposition comes from in all of our composite applications across the board, but especially in batteries with the fact that we can mold in the features in one tool, um, not have to worry about uh, multiple parts being joined together. So you don't have to worry about seal surfaces as much. Um, you don't have potential sources for leak where, you know, if we're doing a cover and a tray and we put them together with one seal, that's, that's really our only issue where if you're doing multiple pieces of aluminum stamping, um, we can get much more um, elegant designs uh, where we can use more, you know, more, more uh, features that are molded into the part as opposed to having to stamp it. So we think parts consolidation and design freedom is, is one of our biggest assets. What about weight reduction? It's still a big issue. You know, the, the batteries are so heavy. If you can sure. make the pack lighter, that's a step forward. Sure. And, and that's, you know, we, we've been, you know, our, our drive for the last five to eight years has been lightweighting across the whole vehicle. And then in the battery boxes are no different. So um, if we can incorporate chemistry that allows us to reduce the amounts of filler um, and increase, you know, the strengths and, and uh, point strengths where we can we can design that box specifically for that application. We can take weight out of the vehicle, um, and you know when you do that, you allow better range. You allow them to you know as we start going to autonomous vehicles, and you're adding more and more features to the next generation vehicles. That's just adding weight. So if we can help them take it out, that's that's our advantage. CSP has a lot of experience with uh, carbon fiber. I, I gotta believe you're looking at that down the road. Absolutely. Um, you know, the carbon fiber brings its own challenges, but, you know, Tejan, our parent company, being a carbon fiber supplier, we have a lot of internal expertise and we've done a lot of work um, in, in behind the scenes, so to speak. But as you alluded to, you know, we have the new the carbon pro box for GM um, that we're, we're making, but that's a, that's a carbon fiber reinforced nylon. But those are the kind of things that allow us to start playing in the lab and, and working be, uh, in our development facilities to try and develop the next gen. So I think, as we, as I mentioned, going to the trays, we're probably going to need much more um, structure, strength, and crash, you know, impact type properties. And carbon fiber and continuous fiber, continuous glass fiber, will allow us to do those kinds of things. Mike, what about a standardized design? I see in China the latest. Uh, regulations for uh, being able to qualify for EV subsidies. One of the, the, the things is if you have a swappable battery pack, you can qualify. Is that something that you're getting from your customers in China? Not yet. I, they're they're starting to talk in that direction. But again, you know, they put the battery into their, their vehicle architecture as is. So swappable, yes. So, but, you know, it's probably going to be vehicle dependent or vehicle line dependent. Um, and again, you know, one of the things we're looking at, too, is it's a global market. So what they make in China probably matches what they're doing in Europe and North America. So we have to be able to provide that you know, across the globe and be consistent across the globe. I got to imagine that making these these battery trays like you're doing uh, is uh, is hard from a logistics standpoint. It, it, it sounds like you're shipping a lot of air or can you nest these things together where you're not wasting so much space as you ship to wherever the battery packs being assembled. Yeah. I mean, it's a combination, you know, we've been doing pickup boxes uh, way, way back to when I started back in the late nineties. Um, we, we know about shipping a lot of air with big pickup boxes, but you know, part of that is getting close to your customer. So being a global supplier and if the market's there, we, you know, we're willing to put in facilities and we have done that where we're closer to the customer base. So the ship, the shipping distances aren't as far. Um, but, and then you can also look at doing, um, you know, assembly nearby, if you will. So set up a, you know, a satellite facility where we can ship into, or even mold on, you know, closer to their site. So that's the nice thing about a compression molded battery box. We need one tool to do, you know, hundred, 200,000 pieces. You can, uh, you can do that and put that tool right next to your customer. And it's not, you know, it's not shipping 10 presses or stamping presses. We can do it with one tool and one press. Yeah, no, that's great to know. What am I missing? I, I've asked you a bunch of questions. Is there anything else that you think we ought to add to this? Well, I would say, you know, traditionally, as I said, it, it was a lot of uh, just standard structure materials. But as we get to more and more difficult 
uh, performance requirements, that, that target moves very quickly. So you have to be able to pivot very quickly. Um, when, you know, we actually had a, a program sourced in China where we met all the requirements. We were going into prototype of the production tool and they said, oh, by the way, we've come up with this new requirement. Uh, you need to reformulate within three months. And that's, that is really difficult. You know, the chemistry can only go so far, but I have a pretty strong team and a lot of really smart guys and girls that uh, have been able to do that very quickly. So we're looking at, you know, next generation materials, you know, the current materials for flame retardancy are, are highly filled. So they're filled with alumina trihydrate and um, those add a lot of weight and a lot of density. But as we move to new things like phenolics and intumescence, um, different chemistries that allow us to take filler out and still perform to even higher levels and get more uh, fiber reinforcement in, we can reduce weight, increase performance, but also give them extreme uh, fire performance. So uh, that's where all the work's you know, um, centered on right now. And then there's also the VOC aspect. You know, we are, we are a polymer and they don't like VOCs. So we're doing a lot of work internally to try and you know, reduce or eliminate VOCs. And for those who don't know, who are watching right now, VOC is yeah. volatile organic compounds. Absolutely. And they go into the atmosphere as you're making these plastic things. And that's a no-no. Absolutely. And uh, we, we, we've learned, again, we've learned a lot in a very short amount of time because historically you haven't seen as much um, requirements on those in North America, but in Europe and Asia, they've been very stringent and North America is following suit now. And, you know, and again, they're, I guess I said, they're global programs. So you're trying to meet the same requirements across the world and it's very difficult. Uh, but uh, again, that's why I have a really strong, smart team that, that handles those kind of things. Well, Mike, I, I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk today because so many people look at a, a battery pack and they think that the outside, it's just a box, you know, what you've pointed out here, a lot of science and engineering goes into that box. Absolutely, it sure does. Well, good, thanks again, Mike. Well, thanks for having me, I really appreciate your time.